I always took pride in being the big man that never got dunked on. So one time in New Jersey, because I'm from Newark, New Jersey, mm -hmm. in front of all the fans, playing against Derek Coleman. And if you don't know Derek Coleman, he's left-handed, he's a beast. So Derek has me on the block, <laughs> and he takes one dribble, two dribbles, drop step, hit me with a little bow, and dunked it. And I didn't really know he dunked it until I came down and the boy. <laughs> he possessed everything you could ask for in a modern day power forward. But he was coming into the league in the early 90s with all these skills, which was even more impressive. He could do it all on the court in his prime and probably dunked on your favorite big man at one point during his career. He was a star at Syracuse and looked like he was going to continue that in New Jersey, as he was a 20 and 10 guy during his five year stint with the Nets. But he had trouble controlling his temper and often seemed to clash with coaches, pushing him out of nearly every situation he was in. Tragedy in New Jersey affected the Nets' trajectory as well and likely affected Coleman's, as when the Nets stopped winning, he became unhappy. And then the remainder of his career was clouded with an inability to keep in shape, struggles with alcohol abuse, and overall questions about his commitment to the game. And although he played 70 games just once after the age of 26, he still put together some great seasons even with his injury and weight struggles. But if you look strictly at his prime years with the Nets, you would never believe that this man would only make one all-star appearance in his career. He was supposed to be a Hall of Famer, and although he'll likely never get that call, a prime Derek Coleman was the last player you wanted to match up with. And that's why he's the topic of today's episode. Let's jog your memory. Derek Coleman was born in Mobile, Alabama, but grew up in Detroit, Michigan, where as a kid, he would befriend future NBA All-Star Steve Smith. Coleman attended Northern High School in Detroit, where he would be a McDonald's All-American in his senior season. And his talent was recognized, as at just 14 years old, his coach told Pistons Hall of Famer Dave Bing about him and Bing would become Coleman's mentor, and Coleman would decide to attend Bing's alma mater when he accepted a scholarship to play for Syracuse and Hall of Fame coach Jim Beheim. Expectations weren't too high for the 87 Syracuse team, as they had lost players like Raphael Addison and Dwayne Pearl Washington, but they still had junior center Ronnie Cycli and sophomore point guard Sherman Douglas, who took an unexpected leap in his second year. Coleman and Stevie Thompson were Syracuse's top recruits, and Coleman would quickly carve out a large role, as he was a day one starter and would finish fourth on the team in scoring, first in rebounds, and second in blocks, while shooting 56%. Syracuse would start the year on a 15 game win streak and rank as high as fifth in the nation. They would finish the regular season at 24 and five and make it all the way to the Big East Championship game before losing to Georgetown. But they saved their best for the NCAA tournament. They entered as a two seed and beat Georgia Southern in round one followed by Western Kentucky in round two. The Sweet 16 brought Florida, and Coleman would finish with 15 points and nine rebounds. He would have his worst offensive performance of the tournament in the Elite Eight versus North Carolina, where he would score eight points on just two of 10 shooting, but would still pull down 14 boards and block three shots, as Syracuse still won and got a final four matchup with Providence, who they would defeat as Coleman had 12 points and 12 rebounds on 66% shooting as Syracuse advanced to their first national championship game in program history. This would be a very competitive game versus Indiana, but one that Syracuse would sadly lose. Coleman only managed 8 points, but he set an NCAA tournament freshman record by pulling down 19 rebounds. Unfortunately, this is likely a game Coleman wants to forget, as with Syracuse up by 1 with about 30 seconds to go, Coleman was at the free throw line for a 1-1 one one that could have all but iced the game but Coleman would come up short on the first free throw. Then Indiana would get the rebound, and Keith Smart would hit a game winner with about 5 seconds left to give the Hoosiers the win, ending Syracuse's incredible season. But for his freshman year, Coleman would average about 12 points, 9 rebounds, and 2 blocks per game, while being named 3rd team All Big East. Syracuse had one of the best starting lineups in the nation going into 1988, with Coleman, Cycli, and Douglas, along with Stevie Thompson, who had now been elevated to a starter as all four would shoot over 51% this season. Syracuse started the year as the top ranked team in the nation, but this wouldn't last long, as they lost two out of four games during the Great Alaskan Shootout, and overall would finish the regular season at 21 and six. Coleman would average a double-double, and his 11 rebounds per game would rank 10th in the nation, and he would shoot a career high 58.7% from the field. This year, Syracuse would win the Big East tournament, as they would defeat Villanova in the final, but their NCAA tournament run would be a big disappointment, they would defeat North Carolina A&T in the first round, even with Coleman struggling, as he put up just 4 points on 2 of 9 shooting. 
but then they would be upset by Rhode Island in round two. Coleman had a much improved game as he put up 16 points and 9 rebounds on 7 of 8 shooting, but he would struggle with fouls as he would foul out after 29 minutes of action, as Syracuse lost by 3 points. Coleman would end his sophomore season averaging about 13.5 points, 11 rebounds, and 1.5 and blocks per game, as he would be named first team All Big East. Going into 1989, Syracuse had lost cycling to the NBA, so expectations for Coleman were high, and he would play center this year to fill the hole left by cycling. But it was easier to switch him over, as Syracuse had a great freshman coming in named Billy Owens. All five starters would average double figures, and Coleman would finish third on the team in scoring and first in rebounds and blocks, as he would rank sixth in the nation in rebounding and fourth in blocks. He would also get in a bit of trouble this year, as he got in a fight with some football players over not wanting to pay admission for a frat party. And Syracuse would start the year 13-0 and rank as high as second in the nation, but would ultimately finish the regular season at 25-6. and They would reach the Big East Championship for the third consecutive year, but would lose to Georgetown. They entered the NCAA tournament as a two-seed, and would have a better showing than the previous year. Coleman would improve his play as each game went on, and would have his best performance in the Elite Eight versus Illinois and their flying Illini offense. He would play all 40 minutes, scoring 17 points and pulling down 10 rebounds. But Illinois would outlast Syracuse, as they won by 3 points ending Syracuse's season. And for his junior season, Coleman averaged about 17 points, 11.5 rebounds, and 3.5 blocks per game, while being named first team all Big East. Douglas was gone for the 1990 season, leaving Coleman as the team's top player, with Thompson and Owens providing great contributions of their own. Coleman would put up career highs in scoring and rebounding, as he again finished top 10 in the nation in rebounding. He would also shoot over 55% from the field, and over 36% from deep on over one attempt per game. Syracuse would start the year as the top ranked team in the nation and go 10-0 before losing to Villanova. Overall, they would end their regular season at 22-5 and, and again make the Big East Tournament Championship, but would lose for the third time in four years, this time to UConn. They would enter the tournament as a two seed and Coleman would have a good tournament as he had at least 14 points and 10 rebounds in each game, but he struggled to make shots in the Sweet 16 versus Minnesota as he went just 5 of 13 from the field, and Syracuse lost, which would mark the end of Coleman's college career, one in which he left the NCAA as the all-time leader in rebounds. And for the regular season, Coleman averaged about 18 points, 12 rebounds, and 2 blocks per game, as he was named First Team All-Big East, Big East Player of the Year, and a consensus First Team All-American. Coleman looked like the complete package. He could score, rebound, and block shots, but was also great at running the floor and was a great ball handler for someone his size. Add in his three-point range at a time where big men were not stretching the floor, and it seemed like he was destined to be an all-time great. So, with the first pick in the 1990 NBA draft, the New Jersey Nets select Derek Coleman from Syracuse. The Nets were coming off a terrible 17-65 and year under head coach Bill Fitch, and Coleman was expected to be the franchise savior. The team did have some good pieces outside of Coleman, as they had former second overall pick Sam Bowie and second year point guard Mookie Blaylock. Additionally, they had a third year high flyer in Chris Morris and had traded for veteran scorer Reggie Theus in the offseason. Coleman would be the starting power forward for a net starting five where each player put up at least 12 points per game. Coleman would finish second on the team in scoring behind Theus and first in rebounds, as he hit double figures in 66 of the 74 games he played, had 40 double doubles, and would record 28 points and 23 rebounds in a November 27th win versus Philly, as well as score a career-high 42 in a February 15th win versus Denver. He finished first among rookies in scoring and rebounding, and his 10.3 rebounds was top 10 in the league, as Coleman would end up winning Rookie of the Year this season and be voted first team All-Rookie. But it was in the middle of this season when the Nets made arguably their biggest acquisition. New Jersey was 13-26 and 26 when they were involved in a three-team deal on January 24th, and the most important piece they would receive would be second-year shooting guard Drazen Petrovic from Portland. The Nets needed some bench scoring, and the second-year Petrovic was coming off a rookie season where he was third in the league in three-point percentage, and he would play great for the Nets in his 43 games with the team. The Nets would go 13-30 and 30 the rest of the way to finish at 26-56, and 56. but Petrovic had shown promise and Coleman had given every indication that he was on his way to stardom, and his rookie season saw him average about 18.5 points, 10.5 rebounds, and a block per game. 
Theus was gone to begin the 92 season, and the Nets clearly believed in Petrovic, making him the starting shooting guard. They had also drafted a lightning quick point guard out of Georgia Tech, named Kenny Anderson. Blaylock would still be the starter this year, but it would be Coleman and Petrovic who would create a dynamic scoring duo for New Jersey, as they combined for over 40 points per game and each shot over 50% from the field. Coleman would struggle with an ankle injury this year as he missed 17 games over the course of the season, but he would finish top 25 in the league in both scoring and rebounding, as he had 59 games in double figures, 35 double doubles, and another 20 and 20 game. But this season would be plagued by ongoing conflict between him and Fitch that had been present since Coleman joined the Nets. Coleman would question his coach's ability in a December 7th game versus the Lakers, when Fitch kept him out of most of the game due to Coleman re-aggravating an ankle injury, even though Coleman said he was good to go. And then the boiling point came at the end of the year, when Coleman refused to re-enter a game in the fourth quarter versus Miami, and would reportedly have some choice words for Fitch. But even with Coleman's ankle and the conflict, the Nets still improved, as they went 40-42 and 42 and would get a playoff matchup with Cleveland. Coleman would have a great playoff debut, as he finished second on the team in scoring and first in rebounds, while recording a double-double in three out of the four games in a four-game series loss. He would shoot at least 50% in the first three games, but would have his worst performance in the series clinching game four, as although he put up a game-high 22 points, he did so on 7 of 21 shooting. But for his regular season, he would average about 20 points, 9.5 rebounds, and 1.5 blocks per game on a career-high 50.4% shooting, the only time in his career where he shot at least 50%. Blaylock was traded to Atlanta during the offseason, meaning Kenny Anderson would be the team's new starter going into 93. Additionally, Fitch resigned after the season and was replaced by former Pistons and Dream Team head coach Chuck Daly. And with Daly at the helm, the Nets and their new trio of Coleman, Anderson, and Petrovic would prove to be one of the top young cores in the league, as Coleman would report that Daly didn't limit him like Fitch did. Coleman would finish second on the team in scoring with a career-high 20.7 points per game, and first in rebounds and blocks, as their trio would combine to average nearly 60 points per game, and according to Coleman, some were starting to refer to him and Anderson as the East Coast Stockton and Malone even though he thought they were going to be better than the legendary Jazz duo. Coleman would be a top 20 scorer and top 10 rebounder in the league, as he would be named second team All-NBA. He would score in double figures in all but two games and record 51 double-doubles and two 20 and 20 games, including a career-high 24 rebounds and a December 20th win versus Sacramento. The Nets were sitting at 31 and 24, but would then suffer a huge loss as Anderson would break his wrist after a flagrant foul by John Starks, knocking him out for the remainder of the year. The Nets would go 12-15 and 15 the rest of the way to finish 43-39 and 39 and get a rematch with Cleveland. However, Anderson's wrist would keep him out of the first round series as well. The series would go five games, and Coleman would do everything he could to make up for the lack of Anderson, but it just wasn't enough, as the Nets lost in five. He would score at least 21 and shoot at least 50% in all 5 games, while playing all 48 minutes in games 2, 4, and 5. He would save his best for last as he put up a postseason career high 33 points, to go along with 16 rebounds in the Nets game 5 loss. And for the regular season, Coleman would average about 20.5 points, 11 rebounds, and 1.5 blocks per game. But the Nets were looking promising going into 94, with the healed Anderson alongside Coleman and Petrovic. A moment of silence was observed for Drazen Petrovic. The Nets star was killed on Monday evening in a car accident in Germany. Petrovic was a native of Croatia. Less than a month since their playoff exit, Petrovic was involved in a fatal car accident while in Poland for a Eurobasket qualification tournament, tragically ending what had all the makings of a Hall of Fame NBA career. The Nets did their best to fill the void by signing Kevin Edwards, who would turn in his best pro season for the team in 94 but he couldn't make up for the loss of Petrovic. And right before the season started, Coleman turned down an eight-year, $69 million offer from the Nets. Due to details like the upfront salary being too low and the final year of the contract being non-guaranteed. However, he would eventually agree to a four-year, $30 million contract extension in February. Coleman would play the healthiest year of his career, as it was his first season as the team's leading scorer and Anderson returned to play all 82 games as the duo combined for 39 points per game, but were not too efficient in doing so. Coleman would be a top 15 scorer and top 10 rebounder with a career-high 11.3 rebounds per game, 
he would score double figures in 69 games, record 47 double-doubles, and two triple-doubles, and would reject a career-high nine shots in a February 1st win versus Seattle. He would be voted to his first and only All-Star game as a starter, and earn his second and final second-team All-NBA selection. The Nets started the year 7-13, but were able to recover and finish with their best record since 1984, at 45-37, and, and a third straight playoff berth, this time versus New York. Coleman would turn in a good series as he led the team in scoring and rebounding and would record a postseason career high 21 rebounds in game two. Unfortunately, the Knicks won in four games, as even though Coleman scored well, he would have a four of 17 shooting performance in game two and then go five of 15 in the series clinching game four loss. Although he would still manage 31 points as he went 21 of 25 from the free throw line. So another season ended in a first round exit, but for his regular season, Coleman averaged about 20 points, 11.5 rebounds, and a career-high 1.8 blocks per game. Coleman's season wouldn't end here though, as he was a member of Dream Team 2, who would be representing the US in the 94 FIBA World Championships, where he would help the team win a gold medal. 95 would be a big step back for New Jersey. Daly had left the team, as it was reported that he felt that some of the players and management weren't mature enough, but it was more likely that he wanted to walk away in good health as he felt his age would catch up to him before the Nets could contend, and he would be replaced with Butch Beard. In the offseason, Anderson had a screw inserted into his wrist, but was bothered by soreness all season, and Coleman would deal with wrist injuries this year as well, as he missed 26 games, but would still put up another 20-10 in 10 season, although he would not play enough games to qualify for the league leaderboards. Coleman and Anderson would still form a solid duo, but the team overall didn't have a lot of direction and seemed to be going backwards after a promising start to Coleman's time there. Coleman would have 53 games in double figures and 34 double doubles, and still record a 20-20 and 20 game on November 29th versus the Lakers. But the Nets couldn't get anything going this year, and finished the season at 30-52, and 52, and missed the playoffs for the first time in four seasons. And for the regular season, Coleman averaged about 20.5 points, 10.5 rebounds, and 1.5 blocks per game. Coleman turned 28 in the offseason and had developed a negative reputation as a player with an attitude problem and less than stellar work ethic. There were a lot of concerns around his temper due to the coaching conflicts and the multiple times that his anger had gotten the best of him on the court, even dating back to his Syracuse days. But Coleman was unhappy as well, as he didn't believe that the Nets were going to be able to build a winner anytime soon. So going into training camp, Coleman requested a trade. He began the year on the Nets, but wasn't playing due to an irregular heartbeat, which would eventually correct itself. And after 13 games, he still hadn't played, but then he got his wish. Coleman was traded to the 76ers for a package headlined by Sean Bradley, as the Sixers were in the midst of an 11-game losing streak and were trying to figure out a way to inject some life into the team. And in looking back at his time with the Nets years later, Coleman speculated that his career may have gone much differently had New Jersey prioritized bringing in a veteran to mentor him instead of giving him the keys to the team as a rookie. But Coleman was now a sixer and would join rookie Jerry Stackhouse and fourth-year forward Clarence Weatherspoon as the team's top players. However, even though Coleman's heart had improved, he would still only appear in 11 games for the Sixers this year, as he was advised by doctors to sit out the remainder of the season after a lingering ankle injury, which was eventually discovered to be an injured tendon. And the Sixers would finish the year at 18-64, and 64, but in his 11 games, he would average about 11 points, 6.5 rebounds, and a block per game. The Sixers would receive the first pick in the 96th draft and select a franchise-altering player in Allen Iverson. Coleman, Iverson, and Stackhouse would form a solid trio, combining for over 62 points per game. But Coleman struggled to stay on the court, as he managed just 57 games and would shoot below 45% for the fourth straight season. He was still a double-double player when he did play, as he had 28 double-doubles, and two 20 and 20 games, but it had now become a matter of availability, as he was developing another negative reputation as an injury prone player. But even with Coleman playing, the Sixers were a ways from success, as they went 18 and 39 with Coleman and 4 and 21 without him, finishing at 22 and 60 and missing the playoffs. And for his regular season, Coleman averaged about 18 points, 10 rebounds, and 1.5 and blocks per game. The 98 Sixers rolled out the same trio and had traded their second overall pick to the Nets for veterans Jim Jackson, Eric Montrose, and Picks. The trio of Coleman, Iverson, and Stackhouse wouldn't last much longer though, as with the Sixers sitting at 6 and 16, they sent Stackhouse to the Pistons for Theo Ratliff and Aaron McKee. 
as new head coach Larry Brown didn't feel that Iverson and Stackhouse could coexist in the backcourt. Coleman would again have an abbreviated year as he struggled with ankle injuries and his irregular heartbeat had returned, and he played in just 59 games. He would still be the team's second leading scorer behind Iverson and leading rebounder, but his efficiency continued to drop as he barely cracked 41% from the field. He would still record 32 double-doubles this year, and the Sixers would improve to 31-51, and 51, but they missed the playoffs, and Coleman averaged about 17.5 points, 10 rebounds, and a block per game. Coleman would be bought out by the Sixers at the end of the year. Larry Brown had been a big fan of Coleman, but Sixers president Pat Croce had not been a fan of Coleman, and was looking for ways to unload him. He had reportedly tried to add a weight clause to any contract talks with Coleman, as he had been out of shape during his time with Philly, which had likely contributed to his injuries. And this angered Coleman, so the Sixers and Coleman would end up agreeing to a contract buyout during the offseason. Coleman would sign on with the Charlotte Hornets for six years, 40 million, prior to the lockout shortened 99 season. He would join a new look Hornets team who let their starting center Vlade Divac walk during the offseason, and were without forward Anthony Mason, who would miss the year with a ruptured bicep. The team featured all star Glenn Rice, but he would be traded to the Lakers mid season for Eddie Jones and Eldon Campbell. Even in the lockout shortened season, Coleman struggled to stay healthy, as he managed just 37 games and put up some of the worst numbers of his career, and would lose his starting spot near the end of the season. And the Hornets would actually fare better when Coleman didn't play, as they went 15 and 22 when he was on the court, and 11 and 2 when he wasn't, as they finished at 26 and 24, but missed the playoffs. And for the regular season, Coleman averaged about 13 points, 9 rebounds, and half a block per game. Going into 2000, Coleman was behind the wheel during a serious car accident that almost took the life of teammate Eldridge Rakasner. Coleman refused a breathalyzer, but was arrested for DUI, which he was later acquitted of due to lack of evidence. But there was still speculation that alcohol was involved, as he would struggle with alcoholism throughout his career. Luckily, everyone would survive, but this wouldn't be the only tragic car accident of the season, as guard Bobby Phils would lose his life when he lost control of his car while street racing on January 12th of this season. Coleman would have a bounce back year in 2000 as he played 74 games, which was his first time playing at least 70 games since 94 and the final time he would do so in his career. He would finish second on the team in scoring behind Eddie Jones and tie for first in rebounds, but his biggest improvement would be his efficiency as his 45.6% shooting was his best since 1993 and he shot a dead career high 36.2% from deep. And this season the Hornets had a winning record with Coleman as they went 43 and 31 when he was in the lineup and finished the year at 49 and 33, marking Coleman's first postseason appearance since 1994, where they would play his former team in the Sixers, but Coleman still couldn't get past the first round as Charlotte lost in 4 games. But Coleman would have a vintage performance as he put up over 20 points and 12 rebounds per game and would score a game high 29 in the Hornets lone win of the series in game 2. And for the regular season, Coleman averaged about 16.5 points, 8.5 rebounds, and 2 blocks per game. Coleman didn't have a good start to the 01 season, as he reported to training camp 30 pounds overweight, so he played the entire year out of shape, and again saw his irregular heartbeat return, and Coleman would even be placed on the injured list for a quote, lack of physical conditioning. Coleman would be stripped of his co-captain title early in the season, and be relegated to a backup role this year, which he wasn't too happy about. The 0-1 Hornets again looked much better as Eddie Jones and Anthony Mason had been traded to Miami in the offseason for Jamal Mashburn and PJ Brown, and second year guard Baron Davis had taken a big leap in year 2. But Coleman would unfortunately look more like an afterthought this year, as overall he only managed 34 games, starting 3 of them, and averaging single digit points for the first time in his career, all while shooting just 38% from the field. However, he would shoot a career high 39.2% from deep. The Hornets 46 and 36 record made the playoffs, where they would sweep Miami in the first round, although Coleman would get limited minutes and average just 5 points. He would then play the first two games of their second round loss to Milwaukee, before logging DNPs the rest of the series. And for the regular season he would put up about 8 points, 5.5 rebounds, and half a block per game. There had reportedly been an opportunity over the summer for the Sixers to reacquire Coleman but Sixers team president Pat Croce had vowed that Coleman would never return to the Sixers as long as he was president. But then in July, he resigned as team president. So with Croce gone, Larry Brown and the Sixers jumped at the opportunity to reacquire the veteran forward that he was so high on years earlier. 
as they acquired Coleman in a three-team trade on October 25th. This was a move that both sides wanted, as Coleman had been trying to get back to Philly for years. The Sixers were coming off an NBA Finals appearance and were hoping that Coleman could provide them with a versatile starting forward who could play minutes at center if needed. Coleman would have a solid season for Philly, as he would be second on the team in scoring behind league leader Allen Iverson, and do so on a relatively efficient 45% from the field, but the Sixers would be hampered by injuries, as their backcourt of Iverson and Eric Snow missed 22 and 21 games respectively. Coleman would also be injured throughout the year, as although he played more games than the previous season, he still missed 24, suffering from a nagging knee injury that had occurred in an early season matchup versus Toronto. He would also miss one game due to suspension for throwing a punch at Utah's Carl Malone in a December 29th game, and this would be a beef that Coleman had held onto for years, as he had referred to Malone as an Uncle Tom during his time with the Nets. Iverson broke his hand on March 22nd with the Sixers sitting at 36 and 32 and trying to stay alive in the playoff chase. So it wasn't looking good, as up to this point the Sixers were 0-8 without Iverson, but Coleman would help the team go 7-7 the rest of the way to hold on to the 6th seed and get the Celtics in round 1. Iverson returned for the playoffs and was still averaging 30 a game, but did so on about 38% shooting. But their second leading scorer was Coleman, and although he averaged just 13 points and 9 rebounds, he was an efficient scorer for the Sixers, shooting over 52% from the field. But a back and forth series would see the Sixers fall to the Celtics in 5 games. And for the regular season, Coleman averaged about 15 points, 9 rebounds, and a block per game. Coleman would be arrested for DUI in the offseason and suspended for one game because of it. He would also opt for surgery on his injured knee from the previous year, as along with his suspension, he would miss the first 10 games of the season and overall play just 64 games. Additionally, Coleman started the season coming off the bench. The Sixers had traded their former Defensive Player of the Year, Dikembe Mutombo, to the Nets for Keith Van Horn and Todd McCullough during the offseason, and Van Horn would be the team's starting power forward before being shifted to small forward when the Sixers acquired Kenny Thomas in a three-team deal in December. However, McCullough started suffering from a neurological disorder that affects the nerves in his feet, which ended his season and eventually his career. So Coleman had to fill in at center for the remainder of the year, as Philly finished with a 48-34 and record. Coleman remained a starter for the first round matchup with his former team in the Charlotte Hornets, and although he would start slow with four points in Game 1, he would end up being one of five starters to put up double figures and would lead the team in blocks for the series as the Sixers won in six games. The second round brought the Pistons and the team split the first four games before Detroit won games five and six by a combined five points to advance. Coleman would have a great series as he would be second on the team at 16 and a half points per game and pull down a team leading 11 rebounds per game and would even drop a game high 23 in the Sixers one point game five loss. However, this would be overshadowed by the fact that he was called for goaltending on Chucky Atkins' game-winning floater attempt with less than a second left, which gave Detroit the win, and his regular season saw him average about 9.5 points, 7 rebounds, and a block per game. 04 would be an injury-filled year for Philly. Prior to the year, Larry Brown had left for a job in Detroit, and the Sixers would end up going through two coaches this season. Coleman played just 34 games as a starter, as a broken finger kept him out for 22 games, and knee tendonitis ended his year early. The Sixers had acquired Glenn Robinson from Atlanta during the offseason, but injuries ruined their year, as Iverson missed 34 games and Robinson missed 40. And even though they had a respectable year, all things considered, their 33-49 record was not enough for the playoffs. And for the regular season, Coleman averaged about 8 points, 5.5 rebounds, and a block per game. The Sixers traded Coleman to the defending champion Pistons in the offseason, where he would be reunited with Larry Brown. But this would be short-lived for Coleman, as he would appear in just five games for Detroit in very limited minutes, and would also be suspended for one game for leaving the bench during the malice at the Palace. He would play three more games after this incident, before being released on January 5th, after putting up averages of two points and three rebounds per game. And that would be the end of the career of Derek Coleman. His career started with so much promise, and there was no doubt he had all the tools to be an all-time great. He had a skill set that was rarely seen in players his size and looked to be on his way to a Hall of Fame career in his first few years in New Jersey. But he lacked maturity and discipline, and he was probably right that the Nets should have brought in a veteran to mentor him in the beginning. But he also should have made his own changes. But those mid-90s Nets are one of the biggest what-ifs, 
as if Petrovic had not been in that car accident, who knows what they could have done. And if the Nets would have been winning, maybe Coleman would have been more committed. Once he arrived in Philadelphia, his weight problems became a major issue, as it severely affected his availability and level of play. And while this may have been attitude and alcohol related, it is important to mention that his irregular heartbeat probably made it difficult for him to stay in shape and push himself safely. His career is one that could have you feeling more frustrated than sympathetic, as he had shown how great he was when he was in shape, and had he been able to keep himself in shape, we would likely be including Derek Coleman in the discussion of the greatest big men of all time, but instead, he's looked at as more of the classic tale of wasted potential. But if someone asks you to build the perfect power forward, it's safe to say he would look a lot like a prime Derek Coleman. But that's it for today's episode on DC. Hope you enjoyed it and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you like this one, check out this video on his Hornets teammate, or this one on his brief teammate during his first stint in Philly. Thanks for watching and see you next time.